Salam, Namaste, Adab, and welcome to today's event. We are going to hear Professor Amir Mufti Saad, Professor of Comparative Literature from University of California, LA, Los Angeles, uh, on Modern Abul Kalam Azad. The title Out of Place and Out of Time, Modern Abul Kalam Azad and the Partition of India. The opening remarks will be given by Salman Qureshi Saad, his friend and a well-known scholar in Canada, is a program director at University of Toronto, the School of Continuing Studies, Canada. Concluding remarks give, will be given by Professor Mohammed Asim Siddiqui, uh, chairman of the Department of English, Aligarh Muslim University. He is a well-known columnist, critic, and author. And uh, welcome you all. And let's go to hear what Salman Qureshi said. I appeal all not to make it out, please, Mute yourself. Thank you, Razi Saab. Uh, everything you said. Hello, everyone. Please mute yourself. I don't know why I cannot. Yeah. I will mute, Razi Bhai. Go ahead. But that becomes a problem. Okay. Uh, sorry, Salman Qureshi Saab, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. No, I was just saying that everything you said is fine, except that I'm not a scholar, but I have been attracted to Amir's work and his scholarship for many reasons. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons is as a lay academic, non-academic reader of his work, I find uh, several things very interesting about uh, two things. Uh, you know, two things strike me as really, yes, really. fascinating in his work. Uh, first Razib, is, uh, Salman Saab, hold on. I am going to mute all of them, or then you can unmute yourself. Or the speakers can unmute. Us. Sorry about that. Now, Salman Saab, you can unmute yourself and other speakers as well. Otherwise, I have to mute everyone. Uh, one All more. right. Thank you. So let me just uh, give you a very brief uh, introduction to Amir's work as I have known it uh, as a lay reader. I find two things more most interesting about his work. One is the kind of... <laughs> Uh, one is the kind of questions that he has chosen to engage with. And the second is his method of inquiry. You know, the questions, if I may oversimplify them really, uh, are these. What is home? Uh, is it a place or is it a feeling? And what are the reasons that we sometimes lose our homes? And how can we belong to a place? Uh, you know, belonging comes very, very frequently in his work. And most often, we belong to a nation state in these times. And uh, more importantly, what happens when others decide whether we do or do not belong? Uh, and so I think he has looked at how these questions in the form of the Jewish questions uh, in Europe and leading up to the partition and Muslim separatism in South Asia how these questions uh, appear in these narratives. So such questions of identity, I think, like home and belonging, still evoke very strong emotions, you know, as news from the subcontinent uh, keep reminding us almost daily. Uh, it seems the tyranny of the past continues to haunt us. In fact, recently, uh, Geetanjali Shri, who's the winner of the International Booker Prize uh, for her novel, Red Samadhi, she said something very interesting. She said, and I quote, partition was never complete. We are half from here and half from there, end quote. And I think that statement echoes what Amir has been arguing in his work, that beyond the physical and territorial partition, you know, there is one that happens inside of us, inside of our identities. And, you know, like the lover in several poems of Faz that he has uh, analyzed, keeps yearning for, for unity. The other interesting part, of course, as I said, one is the kind of questions. The other is 
his method and scope of inquiry. You know, so like his illustrious teacher and mentor, Edward Said, Amir has not stopped at the non-fictional historical narratives. You know, he has scanned, and if I may use the word, deconstructed uh, some known and some not so well-known works of literature, poetry of Faz, uh, short stories of Manto, novels of George Eliot and Anita Desai, as well as autobiographical works like in today's lecture. So when it comes to partition, we know the cast of characters quite well, you know, uh, Jinnah, Gandhi, Nehru, Mountbatten, Sardar Patel, and Maulana Azad, the most prominent of them. And they have been extensively researched and books have been written on them. Uh, Maulana Azad, as we know him, uh, was part of the secular and liberal tradition in Indian nationalism. And we also know that he, like Gandhi and Nehru, rejected the two-nation theory and the separatism that gave birth to it. But is that all that is to it? And I think Amir's work is an attempt to go beneath the surface of these narratives. His, his work, I feel, uh, is a plea to think more deeply about concepts like secularism, liberalism, minorities, assimilation, multiculturalism, concepts that we have somehow come to take for granted and, you know, which we often treat as sacrosanct. I think what Amir does is not so much reject these terms like some right-wing ideologues, but he regards them as insufficient, as if these were not large enough to hold the complex issues of identity that we face. And, you know, in this attempt, he goes uh, for the creative and poetic imagination. Uh, and he argues that that can sometimes be richer and more rewarding than the recorded history. So with these words, I would really like to uh, ask Amir to take over. And, uh, you know, following him, uh, Professor Asim Siddiqui will also talk about... Thank you. I think, Amir, why don't you start? You are muted, I think. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, Raji Saab, thank you so much for inviting me again into this, uh, into this wonderful maj majlis of yours. Um, and uh, thanks to Salman Saab for <laughs> introducing me for the second time, taking on this, what must be a rather onerous uh, uh, responsibility. And um, I want to thank also um, uh, Professor um, uh, Asim Siddiqui Saab for uh, agreeing to um, uh, sort of respond to these reflections that I'm going to share with you today. Uh, and actually thank him for a recent article of his, I believe in Scroll, if I'm not mistaken, on the role that the English department at Aligarh has played in the uh, sort of history of Urdu letters, of Urdu literature over decades, over the last century, really. Uh, uh, really, I learned a great deal from, from the article, so thank you for that. Uh, it is true that those of us who come from the world of English and try to poke our nose into the world of Urdu, uh, you know, it's a bit of a hornet's nest sometimes, uh, not always welcomed and well-received. I've, I've experienced this over the years myself. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, uh, Raji Saab suggested, or uh, maybe I suggested to him, but we both agreed that I should sort of, uh, following my discussion of Fez several uh, months ago, uh, should now sort of uh, uh, turn to Azad. And these are both figures that I have dealt with very in, in, in a lot of detail, I think, uh, in my book, Enlightenment in the Colony. Um, published in 2007. Uh, it's now scheduled for a second edition with expanded sort of with, with new chapters and expanded uh, um, materials and all of the chapters and um, 
uh, a new preface and so on. Um, and I'm trying to say in this new edition some things more more directly than I had done in the first edition, that really it's about the fate of minorities, uh, the, the fate of minorities in the modern world, not as a unique problem in South Asia or Europe, but really as a comparative, in a comparative framework, trying to think about what majorities and minorities are and how these conflicts sort of play out and so on. So, uh, as, and, and the, the the third figure in that book uh, that I've de dealt with in detail is that of Sadat Hassan Manto. Uh, in any case, so I'm going to say a few things really. I'll time myself better this time, Razi Saab. I'm sorry, last time it went over time a bit. It was my first time here. So I'll say a few things about Azad, uh, read a few passages uh, from his works, uh, and then... Um, 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 uh, Professor Asim Siddiqui can um, respond and sort of open up this discussion. So what can possibly be said about Azad that has not been said before? I think this is a fair question to ask. I'm sure some of you are asking this question. I think Razi Saab was also in some ways asking this question uh, the other day on, uh, on, on a text exchange. Well, I think actually that quite a bit can be said that has not been said. Uh, and I'm going to just attempt a couple of small things here. Um, there are many Azads. Azad is a, a remarkable personality, a capacious uh, intellect and intelligence, really a genius of some sort. Uh, I think it would be fair to say, uh, colloquially speaking, um, uh, and, and as I said, there are, there are many different Azads. There's the Azad of a sort of religious disputation in the early decades of the 20th century from when he was a very young man. Um, in his teens, he became a sort of nationally known name in the Urdu world by launching uh, a magazine. Uh, he was responsible for several magazines, in fact, in the teens and, and 20s and into the 30s. Uh, uh, publishing them, editing them, and so on. Lisan of Sitr, uh, for instance, uh, Al Balagh, um, and so on. Uh, several of these were banned by the British for their sort of subversive nature, and so on. Uh, from the very beginning, a very anti colonial uh, thinker and publicist, uh, even as his views on all kinds of other matters changed and sort of underwent transformation uh, over the years very, very dramatic changes in some ways from a uh, what he himself calls a kind of taqlidi or traditional religiosity early in his life uh, to sort of illegal rationalism um, um, and Sir Sayyid uh, as a kind of, um, as a kind of um, intellectual mentor in absentia and uh, eventually really even a sort of socialism under the influence and friendship of Nehru and, and, and the left wing of the Congress more broadly. So despite all these changes, um, um, uh, despite all these changes, he remains a very powerfully anti-colonial thinker, okay? It's not just a kind of a, a knee jerk, a nationalist rejection of foreign dominance and so on, but really a very careful thinker about what colonialism is, what colonial domination looks like, what it does to the society that it colonizes and so on. Okay, so in any case, I, I think quite a bit can be said about him because um, um, uh, as I said, there are many different Azads that have not quite been synthesized together. There have been several attempts, I think, uh, more or less successful, and mine is one of them. Uh, but for instance, um, the late um, uh, scholar uh, and communist activist Ejaz Ahmad uh, wrote really, I think, a, a very important study, a very long article uh, that was published in a volume uh, edited by Mushirul Hassan, Professor, the late Professor Mushirul Hassan. So, um, uh, and and there is a, bi a biography in English uh, uh, and and so on. Of course, a lot of writing has been done in India and Urdu. And I'm told Hindi, uh, my my Hindi is is uh, my ability to read uh, 
a Hindi is, is very, well, I shouldn't say minimal, it's just very slow. It just, I'm, I'm self-taught, so it's it's very slow. It just takes me longer to read a text in Hindi than it than it does, uh, obviously, in Urdu. So any, in any case, there have been a lot of sort of work on him and, and scholarship uh, in, in, both, uh, in both the Urdu sphere and the Hindi sphere. Uh, the Anglophone sphere in particular, I think, in, in, in the Anglophone sphere, he remains a somewhat mysterious figure based largely on the knowledge of a handful of English language writings or English language translations uh, uh, of his work. And India Wins Freedom is the most uh, popular, probably, of this, of, of this body of material, which was published only ever, as I uh, as I, to the extent that I know, uh, only ever in English, it is thought to have been dictated in Urdu uh, to his Anam Nuensis Humayun um, Kabir, um, I believe, and uh, translated and uh, published by him uh, in, uh, in, in English. And of course, it's a notorious work with the famous uh, pages that were that were to be kept uh, uh, unpublished and secret for several decades, 50 years, I think, and so on. In any case, uh, the Anglophone world, obviously, of which I am a part, uh, it, it seems to me has a, a very partial, really, understanding of Azad. He's the iconic figure of a kind of um, Muslim partition and in Indian um, nationalism. Uh, in the high period of, of Indian nationalism, let's say from the uh, uh, from the uh, beginning of the 20th century up to the point of independence and so on. Uh, and of course, plays a major role as the a Minister of Education in India in, in the Nehru governments uh, until his death. Uh, so um, uh, um, there is, of course, another Azad, which is the Azad of uh, religious disputation of very formal very technical writing in, in theology and um, all kinds of matters that can really be spoken of as pertaining to one aspect or another of Sharia. Uh, an um, important writer on, on uh, the concept of Hijrat itself, actually, during and after the First World War, um, 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 uh, you know, he... <laughs> He actually called upon the Muslims of India to, to do hijrat to Afghanistan at some point. I mean, quite a remarkable thing, you know, the entire sort of tens of millions of, of uh, the population of, of Muslim India uh, imagining it as, in fact, leaving this Darul Harb of, uh, of uh, British rule and so on uh, and resettling itself uh, in the abode of Islam, as it were. Um, and um, in Pakistan, he is very little known, really. I don't think it's unfair to say that. Uh, there are, of course, people who know his work. I've, I've, I've had many conversations. Uh, but the broader uh, sort of access to Azad in Pakistan, I think, again, has to do with his religious writings, which are available in fragments, uh, grouped together by, by topic uh, uh, and so on. Uh, in numerous volumes, not very carefully produced, um, uh, full of mistakes, you know, a kind of popular literature in Islamic disputation uh, that is part of the lives of, uh, of the life of uh, Muslim South Asia in all of its linguistic and regional and ethnic um, uh, variety. Uh, I personally had a very interesting experience of this once in Morocco, of all places, uh, in a uh, in an Islamic bookstore in the capital city of Rabat. I found one such collection of his writings translated uh, into uh, translated into Arabic. So you know he has a certain kind of place, like Maududi, of course, Maududi to a much greater Maulana Maududi, Abu Ala Maududi. A, to a much greater extent, um, a certain uh, a presence in the sort of political Islam, even militant Islam, okay, uh, from his very sort of rigorous, um, uh, in some ways, really Salafi writings uh, um, um, uh, in, in the teens and 20s, what we would today call Salafia uh, uh, in the Arab world, Salafism in English, and so on. Uh, that is to say, a kind of revivalism, a kind of um, a kind of uh, um, non-traditional, anti-traditional, traditional in the sense of taklid, uh, um, and and he, in fact, you know, has written very movingly about his loss of faith 
uh, out of that Taklidi culture of the home. His father was a peer with the following uh, and so on. Um, so there is this, uh, there is this Islamic azad, very, very, you know, and people who might read these works of his uh, in extract and so on in Pakistan, for instance, would be largely unaware of his politics, would be largely unaware of this wider um, context of his life and work uh, in which that Islamic uh, writing was produced as an anti-colonial activist, uh, a thinker and so on. Uh, and of course, as a critic of Muslim separatism, I'll come to that, uh, of course, in a second. Uh, so uh, on the one hand, he's of course, a major figure of the nationalist movement. Uh, again, as I said, as this sort of high period in the history of Indian nationalism, uh, the period in which it becomes a mass movement uh, from being a sort of, the Congress from goes from being a sort of uh, uh, elite debating club in the late 19th century to a kind of mass movement in the 19, uh, in the 20th century. First, of course, with the Swadeshi movement and the question of the partition of Bengal in the first decade of the 20th century. And then during and after the Second World War with the entry of Gandhi, the return of Gandhi to India and his very quick takeover really of a leadership role uh, in the Congress, which peculiarly enough really comes about as a result of his leadership in the Khilafat movement. I mean, uh, Gandhi was, was chosen to be the head of the Khilafat uh, uh, working committee or whatever it was called, rather than let's say one of the Ali brothers and so on. Uh, and Azad himself as a young man is very involved uh, in, in the Khilafat movement uh, at a high level, at a leadership level, again, due to his um, celebrity and notoriety as a, uh, as a sort of activist journalist. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, he, you know, he is, he is a major figure with a very distinct uh, trajectory of his own uh, into the nationalist movement. On the other hand, uh, you know, rather unlike Gandhi and Nehru, it seems to me, he remains a somewhat singular, singular and detached figure uh, compared to the likes of Gandhi, Nehru, uh, Nehru, Bose, and even let's say Ambedkar, who is also of course a dissident from the Congress, um, nevertheless can be said to have a mass following. I mean, certainly in, in, in the, the Dalit population uh, of, of uh, North and Central India. Um, Azad seems really a, a very different kind of figure. He's very detached, even lonely figure in many ways. And he writes very movingly about it in different places, okay? Uh, he, he talks about his sort of solitary uh, nature. He talks about his um, uh, essentially loneliness. I think it's an accurate word uh, uh, within, within this mass movement uh, that is uh, the Indian Nationalist Movement and the Congress uh, in particular. There is no mass group in society that we can associate with his name. You know, it's, that's, that's what I'm trying to sort of suggest in a certain way, that despite being a member of this mass movement, uh, he does not claim to represent any mass segment of society. Uh, of course, he speaks of Muslims uh, in the first person plural. Um, we Muslims are, are, are history and so on. Uh, but as I'm going to point out with a couple of passages momentarily, that's really a reference to the Ashraf, that is to say to a tiny minority of the Muslim population about like, now, I mean, I believe uh, uh, 10 to 12%, the um, Muslim Dalit movement actually claims that it's even smaller um, percentage of the total Muslim population within India, uh, seven, eight, nine percent or something of that sort. Uh, uh, and that's hardly a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, you know, that's hardly a kind of uh, um, claim to sort of mass representation in the way we speak of Gandhi as representing the Indian peasantry as a whole. You know, uh, Nehru says uh, in, in Discovery of India, or maybe it's in the autobiography, he says Gandhi actually is peasant India. He starts by saying that he has his pulse 
He has his finger on the pulse of present India. He understands how the peasantry, how the masses will respond to various actions that we, the, the leadership might take, how they might respond to certain actions of the state or not respond and so on. Uh, that he really seems to understand the sector of, of society in a way that I, that is to say Jawaharlal Nehru, do not understand. And Nehru of course speaks of himself very poignantly as an outsider in India, you know, that he's really looking at India as an outsider because of his, his, his English education and so on. And Gandhi, of course, referred to him um, um, jokingly as the last English ruler, as the last English ruler of India, but nevertheless supported him over Patel, right? This a great historical problem and question that historians keep addressing uh, to be the prime minister, let us say. Uh, in any case, um, uh, so Azad is this sort of solitary, singular, and detached figure, um, uh, and, and not a mass politician in, in the way that the other major leaders are. Um, he was an accomplished politician from very early on. I mean, the nitty gritty of, of doing politics, organizational politics, uh, um, uh, 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 and, and so on. Uh, and a, a very polished statesman, we can say, by the by the time uh, he is, um, let's say, by the 30s and certainly 40s, he became the president again of the Congress in 1940. Uh, soon after the uh, so-called Pakistan Declaration was issued in Lahore by the Muslim League. Uh, and then remains the president, uh, I think, till 46, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he first became president at the young, he was the youngest president ever of the Congress, of the Working Committee, I think is the technical title is the president of the Working Committee or something like that. Um, uh, first assumed this role at the age of 35. Um, uh, and he might even be the, the youngest president still really ever uh, of the Congress. Well, that can't be Rajiv Gandhi, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi has been uh, president in recent years, possibly at a younger age. Uh, in any case, um, as for his Islamic, as for the Islamic scholar Azad, uh, the major Islamic scholar, uh, he is part of the generation that helped to define a modern Islamic discourse, uh, starting in the late 19th century, in some ways starting really with, with uh, Sir Sayyid uh, in uh, the 1860s and so on. Uh, or 1850s really and so on, uh, but really a kind of wide Islamic disputation that takes place in Urdu and so on within the Urdu uh, language uh, sphere. Uh, uh, he is really part of that generation, I think, uh, that, that makes that possible. Um, Shibli Nomani and others that um, Modudi, of course, as a, as a major figure, Modudi was, I believe, about 20 years younger than Azad. Um, <clears throat> so he's part of this generation that really creates, invents a modern discourse on, on uh, various aspects of Islam uh, in, in, in Urdu as a kind of uh, modern institution and discourse for the first time. He is also, however, uh, uh, so one thing in this regard, he, uh, um, uh, when I talk about this sort of Islamic public sphere or Muslim public sphere in, uh, uh, in India in these early decades of the 20th century, it of course involves also ulama of a very formal sort associated with one um, seminary uh, or another, Farangi Mehel, Deoband, and so on. Uh, and Azad didn't have, I'll, I'll say in a, in a second more about his education. Um, um, there's always tensions with the uh, with the sort of a professional ulama, you know, because he's not a professional alim in that sense. He's a, a politician and journalist and writer and so on, who also writes very significantly on Islamic themes. Uh, but he... Uh, there remains a tension between him and the uh, formally trained and institutionally based uh, ulama. Uh, he cannot quite marshal the same religious authority that they are able to, uh, uh, and, and this remains a sort of tension uh, between them. Uh, he's also a deeply learned secular and historical scholar. Uh, Mr. Uh, Razi Saab just used uh, the word secular uh, uh, in his um, uh, in his context. Uh, and of course, in that 
very South Asian sense that we have of the word secular, that is to say non-communalist, really, I think that's what it means, right? Um, in that sense, yes, he is very much a figure of, of secularism, uh, but like Gandhi, he's not a secular thinker or a secular writer and so on, deeply immersed in, in religious traditions and so on. However, he is also a secular scholar, a secular and historical scholar. And even his religious writings really marshal a very broad, they bring to the task a very broad um, secular learning, historical learning and so on. So that for instance, like Modudi, whose book on his famous book on Jihad, I'm sorry, in case people aren't familiar with the name of, anyone is not familiar with the name of uh, Modudi, he is of course the founder of the jamaat e islami the first really uh, 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 politically Islamist organization, I would say, uh, in the world as a kind of political party, really, uh, that is deeply influ influential on the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in, in later decades and so on, especially on the figure of Sayyid Qutb uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Um, uh, like the, um, Modudi, who in his book on jihad was published, I believe, in 27, in 1927, uh, in the 20s, certainly, you know, after the sort of uh, Rangila Rasul controversy and, and so on, uh, the famous sort of uh, a prophet and blasphemy controversy. This question is more than 100 years old, by the way, that we see now play out in Danish cartoons and God knows what else globally. Uh, but its origins are really in, in Muslim South Asia and really in, in, in British India uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, when when Madhudi writes his book on jihad, in part uh, as a justification of certain kinds of, of violent action, of violence, let's say, um, he, he brings to that task writing on the Islamic doctrine of jihad, you know, which is, which, uh, uh, which is a very diffuse phenomenon. There's no centralized doctrine in any of the legal schools and so on. Uh, he brings a very wide learning, Modudi does, of the Byzantine empire and its practices and ideas of holy war, um, of the Persian empire. That is to say the entire, um, um, uh, the entire Near Eastern world within which Islam was born and, and the different civilizations and religions and cultures from which early Islamic civilization took certain elements, you know, as it came in contact with Persian civilization and, and, and with Byzantine Roman civilization and so on. Well, Azad has similar kind of learning, perhaps even more prodigious, uh, prodigious in some ways, more impressive in many ways, and brings really a very complex uh, knowledge uh, to these uh, to these questions. Um, he's also an accomplished stylist in Urdu, really a superb writer of the Urdu language, an exquisite writer, uh, I would say, and really helps define a kind of a formal and high style in Urdu prose through his journalism and through his subsequent sort of major works uh, uh, of the uh, 20s, uh, 30s, and 40s, including the great uh, Tafheem al-Quran, the, the, the commentary on the Quran, which remained unfinished, but even unfinished, it's uh, composed of three gigantic volumes, uh, the first of which, I, sorry, I don't have it here on my desk at the moment, um, uh, it's, it's probably it's six. Tarjuman al-Quran. Sorry? Tarjuman al-Quran. Tafim al-Quran is Madhudi's, thank you. Yes. Um, so Tarjuman al-Quran, uh, the first volume, uh, which is several hundred pages, I would say five to seven hundred pages long, is dedicated entirely to Surah Fatiha, you know, to the first few lines, uh, opening lines of the Quran. Incredible sort of uh, complexity of scholarship and erudition and so on. Okay. Um, uh, um, <clears throat> I think his biography, uh, uh, his education and so on are also rather unique uh, among his contemporaries uh, in the Congress leadership. So let me say a few words about that. Um, uh, and then we will look at a few passages uh, and I wanna say a few words about uh, how I see, um, sorry, excuse me one second here. Um, 
really how I see his views on uh, the Hindu Muslim question and on the possibility of partition uh, in the 1940s as distinct from really anyone else, very, very unique uh, understanding that he shares and in, in, that he develops in a number of writings. So he was born in Mecca in uh, then Ottoman Arabia, um, where his family had lived for some years. Uh, he was born presumably in, in the late 1880s, possibly the date that is attributed usually is 1888. Uh, but the facts of his early life are far from settled. And he gives wildly divergent facts at different points in his, uh, in his uh, early life. He was raised in Calcutta, where the family moved very early in Azad's life. He was exposed to the radical politics of the city from early on, but given a very different education from the one that was increasingly typical uh, of uh, middle class and elite circles in Calcutta. Calcutta, of course, uh, uh, being the uh, capital of the empire and being the place the city where, in fact, the entire complex history of education in, Col in colonial India uh, first emerged, um, starting in, let's say, the 1820s and so on with Hindu college and its sort of gradual expansion to a mass uh, practice and mass phenomenon, English language education, uh, a westernized uh, 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 Bangla language education and so on, which of course spreads uh, nationwide, subcontinent wide uh, in the course of the 19th century. All of that somehow he's removed from because he received a very different kind of education. He received a, an education at home, not in some formal uh, Islamic educational setting. His father, as I said, was himself a scholar and peer uh, and he, he educated him himself and then with a series of Malvis and so on for different subjects. Um, uh, so he's educated in some version of, of the Darsin Nizami, right? Of what we know as the Darsin Nizami, that is to say the sort of traditional Islamic uh, curriculum of the North Indian Ashraf elites, certainly, um, um, that is associated most with Farangi Mehal, with the, with the seminary of, of Farangi Mehal in, in, uh, uh, in Awad. And um, um, uh, so he receives this very strange, um, uh, a very strange education that is far removed from contemporary Calcutta, from the, from the intellectual uh, ferment and political ferment of uh, of contemporary Calcutta, of course, but but at the same time he has close friendships with um, Bengali revolutionaries uh, and so on. Uh, became involved in their circles a few times and uh, uh, wrote in their support in his periodicals and was in fact uh, jailed uh, several times uh, uh, for activities of that sort. Uh, it's very interesting. I mean, we can sum up all of this by saying that he's an anachronistic figure. An anachron that is to say, a figure who is in some ways out, out of his own time, okay? Who lives a life that is not quite of its time. And he reflects on this question very movingly in a number of places. Uh, as he himself says of this anachronistic background with more than a bit of pathos, in his great book, Ghubar e Khatir, published after the Second World War, uh, written during the war, and I'll say a few uh, words about this book in particular shortly. He says uh, at one point uh, in, this, uh, in this book, Is etibar se goya so baras pehle ke hindustan mein mein zindagi basar kar raha tha. He describes his own life as, as, a, as a life that is out of time by about a century. Really a remarkable judgment to make about oneself. Uh, it is, of course, a really modern judgment, right? It is a, it is a judgment uh, about a certain kind of uh, Islamic culture and Islamic civilization from within modernity, right? That, that sees this Islamic culture and civilization and in this case, education and so on. Uh, as somehow outside of moder modernity, as pre-modern fundamentally in some ways. Um, 
So he, he sees himself as simultaneously living in some traditional universe and in the modern world at the same time, okay? Very, very complex self-perception that he elaborates in great detail. Robare uh, Khater, by the way, if anyone uh, here has not read it, I, <laughs> I would say really anyone who can read Urdu has to read this book at some point in their lives. I mean, it's simply an extraordinary work, a beautiful piece of writing, a, a complex work of, of political and social and cultural thought and simply in, uh, um, exquisite uh, uh, Urdu prose. Um, Nehru's judgment on this aspect uh, of Azad's life, this anachronism, as he calls it, and by the way, he uses this word essentially. He says he uses the Urdu term na vakt, na vakt, which I don't think is, is uh, in some ways, is his coinage possibly. I mean, it's it's not a it's not a uh, exact phrase that I've encountered really anywhere else. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected by anyone who, who disagrees with that. Um, but this aspect of the anachronism of, of, of uh, Azad's life, Nehru has uh, some comments on it uh, in his own monumental work, The Discovery of India, uh, a monumental vindication of Indian nationalism, and uh, in particular of his own variety of Indian nationalism, what we now call, in fact, Nehruvian nationalism, uh, that is to say, a sort of secular, uh, socialist, inclusive, uh, anti-communalist nationalism. And, and uh, Nehru passes a rather brutal, a much rougher judgment on Azad than Azad's own very uh, subtle understanding of this anachronism of his life. And Nehru says, and I'm quoting, he was a strange mixture, speaking of Azad, he was a strange mixture of medieval scholasticism, 18th century rationalism, and the modern outlook. Uh, and this is someone who was very, very close to him, of course. Uh, they, were, they were, by all accounts, um, very dear friends uh, from very early on uh, in, the, in the 1920s uh, and uh, supported each other uh, throughout their political career within the debates of the Congress itself. So he's outside of many things, uh, Azad. He's outside of the Anglophone culture of the colonial Indian bourgeoisie. And that's what Nehru is saying here, right? When he calls him an example of 18th century, oh, sorry, of um, uh, medieval scholasticism, right? He's talking about, he's not talking about uh, Thomas Aquinas. He's talking about a Islamic scholasticism of some sort, right? Um, so he and and what he's what Nehru is saying is he's not an individual of the modern sort, as he says repeatedly about various Muslims. Okay, not an individual of the modern sort. That is a phrase that occurs in a few places in uh, in in uh, the discovery of India. Um, so he's outside of the Anglophone culture of the colonial Indian bourgeoisie, of whom um, Nehru is a uh, really representative figure. Um, you know, when Discovery of India is uh, uh, reviewed by D.D. Kosambi in the uh, Communist Journal Social Scientist, uh, the title of the review, uh, which may or may not have been chosen by Kosambi, of course, is The Indian Bourgeoisie Comes of Age. Okay, So Nehru really is a kind of figure of uh, exemplary figure of the development of, of an Indian nationalist bourgeoisie and so on. Uh, and Azad to Nehru is outside of this. And I think in some ways that is an accurate statement. And Azad himself is re uh, reflecting on this in, in various ways. On the other hand, as I've already said, he's also outside the formal culture of, of, of the Islamic ulama. You know, he's not, he's, he, in, in, yes, he receives the title of Maulana, but that's a title very easily given in, in Indo-Islamic culture, as we know, I mean, even the Ali brothers, Oxbridge educated and so on, acquired the title of, of, of uh, Maulana, um, 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 Muhammad Ali and Shokat Ali and so on in, uh, in the course of the Khilafic movement. Okay, 
Discovery of India and Ghubare Khatir uh, are in fact deeply connected books and I've, uh, I've written at length about them together in, uh, in my work, in my book, the Enlightenment in the Colony that I mentioned uh, at the outset. Um, and part of their connection for the benefit of those of you who haven't read that chapter of mine, um, they were written in the same place and time namely during their author's internment at Ahmednagar Fort in Maharashtra during the Second World War uh, for their opposition to Britain's involvement of India in the war effort. Uh, in other words, after the passage of so-called Quit India Movement, the Indian Congress leadership tried to get the British to commit to uh, independence or at least dominion status within the Commonwealth. Um, um, in exchange for their support of the war effort, you know, to actively work for the war effort in India against uh, the Japanese and the Germans and, and the Nazis and so on. And the British, of course, uh, refused, uh, Viceroy Lindrithgar, I believe, uh, refused. And therefore, this famous, um, this famous uh, resolution was passed uh, calling on the British to quit India. It, as you know, it's come to be known as a quit India resolution. And the entire leadership uh, is arrested, and in fact, several tiers of leadership of the hierarchy of the hierarchy of the Congress is arrested, and most of the working committee, um, uh, most of uh, these uh, of the very high leadership is is imprisoned together in um, Ahmednagar Fort, and uh, uh, Azad and Nehru are in the same barracks within the fort. It's really quite a, a fabulous irony in some ways they are on on other sides of a of a partition of of a wooden partition you know in victorian furniture this kind of room divider that that in south asia we refer to as a partition i grew up with one of these things in my home in fact in pakistan uh in any case uh, they are in the same room in the same space that is divided by this uh, wooden partition and they are both writing these books in this place and time okay it's really quite an extraordinary image if you think about it. Uh, the one, this mon the, the first, doc, doc, the, the discovery of India, this monumental uh, history of Indian nationalism out of the ancient civilization of India over the centuries and its entire history and so on. On the other hand, this very quiet little book, you know, that, that really is not very well known. Uh, it's written in a very different manner as a series of letters uh, to his friend Habibur Rahman Sherwani, the founding uh, vice chancellor of uh, Usmania University, major figure in, in the history of a sort of uh, education debates uh, in in uh, in in um, uh, in Muslim India and so on. I see that my former teacher David Lelyveld is here. He can he can correct any mistake that I I make uh, in this regard as the leading historian of uh, of these matters. Um, he sp has spent his whole life really immersed in taking positions regarding what I have called uh, in my book, the crisis of Muslim identity. And, and at one point or another really comes to occupy almost every major position from Aligarh rationalism to a kind of anti-colonialism. Of course, Saeed Ahmed Khan is not anti-colonial on the contrary. Uh, exactly the opposite. So, so Azad sort of goes through that whole uh, transition. Uh, he's associated with the Nadva uh, in, 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 for a certain time uh, uh, with, with um, uh, Shibli Nomani, with that whole tendency and so on. Uh, so he, his, his whole life really is immersed in this question of who the Muslims are as a people as a whole, uh, in India, who the Muslims of India are, what is the nature of their identity, their culture, their place in Indian society, what is their history, and so on. Uh, and I'll say a few more words about that as well in a second. Um, <clears throat> he developed by the 1940s a really complex theory of the so-called Muslim question, a very complex theory, much more complex than that that Nehru offers us in works like his autobiography and especially in um, uh, the discovery of India. Um, so let's look at a couple of uh, uh, passages from uh, his works. So, Radhisab, can you tell me how many minutes more I can take? 
जी वी स्टार्टेड अ बिट लेट आप 15 15 मिनट ले लीजिए जी हां देयर विल बी देयर विल बी प्लेन हो जाएगा जी जी हो जाएगा 15 से 15 20 मिनट ले लीजिए Okay. You are doing, you are doing well. You are doing well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just find the passage that I wanted to read out. Read first. Um, so uh, I'm going to read a couple of passages from a very famous speech of Azad's uh, that is known as the Ramgarh Address. uh given uh at the congress uh, uh annual meetings um in ramgarh uh in 1940 uh he has been elected the president uh, of of the of the organization and uh the muslim league has uh, issued just issued the um uh so called lahore resolution on uh, on the creation on the demand formulating a demand for a, um, a muslim homeland um although what exactly that envisions and means uh, whether it means a different nation state or uh, some kind of a um agglomeration within a federally uh, uh structured sort of uh, uh, india and so on is of course a very complex historical question um <clears throat> okay so um uh it's an extraordinary uh, speech uh um, Uh, with a brilliant analysis of the contemporary historical situation in 1940 the second world war is raging an account really of world politics and then an account in great detail of um the historical situation in india itself um uh, vis-a-vis the colonial state and so on uh, he reports on certain correspondence correspondence with the vice with the viceroy on this question of the war effort and so on a uh, biting critique of of uh, of his response and of um, uh, 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 and of colonial policies more broadly then he turns to the hindu muslim question in detail so let me read a couple of passages out here um sorry just one second Oh, sorry. One second, please. He says, and it, it uh, 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 does a number of things here. First of all, of course, he talks about what Muslim identity is in India. Who who is a Muslim? what does it mean mean to be does, is there even such a thing as an indian muslim you know this recurring question of course that is again very relevant and pertinent uh, and and very urgent in our own times uh, he says main musliman hu aur fakhr ke sath mehsoos karta hu ke musliman hu islam ki 1300 barss ki shandar riwayatein mere virse mein aayi hain main taiyar nahi ki iska koi chote se chota hissa bhi zaya hone do islam ki taaleem اسلام کی تاریخ اسلام کے علوم و فنون اسلام کی تہذیب میری دولت کا سرمایہ ہے اور میرا فرض ہے کہ اس کی حفاظت کروں بحیثیت مسلمان ہونے کے میں مذہبی اور میں مذہبی اور اور کلچرل یوز دی انگلش ورڈ کلچرل دائرے میں اپنی ایک خاص ہستی رکھتا ہوں اس میں اور اور میں برداشت نہیں کر سکتا کہ اس میں کوئی مداخلت کرے لیکن ان تمام احساسات کے ساتھ میں ایک اور احساس بھی رکھتا ہوں جسے میری زندگی کی حقوقتوں حقیقتوں نے پیدا کیا ہے اسلام کی روح مجھے اس سے نہیں روکتی وہ وہ اس راہ میں میری رہنمائی کرتی ہے میں فخر کے ساتھ محسوس کرتا ہوں کہ میں ہندوستانی ہوں میں ہندوستان کی ایک اور ناقابل تقسیم متحدہ قومیت کا ایک عنصر ہوں میں اس متحدہ قومیت کا ایک ایک ایسا اہم عنصر ہوں جس کے بغیر اس کی عظمت یعنی ہندوستان کی قومیت جس کے بغیر اس کی اس کی عظمت کا ہیکل ادھورا رہ جاتا ہے میں اس کی تکوین کا ایک ناگزیر عامل ہوں میں اپنے اس دعوے سے کبھی دستبردار نہیں ہو سکتا and some of these urdu words by the way in the uh, sahitya academy edition of his khutbat edited by uh, malik ram 
give in brackets an English equivalent uh, uh, to the word. For instance, the word amil is translated as factor uh, 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 and so on. Okay, so um, One of the things that he does, sorry, one more passage then. Um, um, one second, please. Um, so one of, the, one of the things he tackled was the question of Muslim identity as yes, cultural, civilizational, historical question and so on. Uh, another thing really very remarkably done here is his elaboration of his understanding of minority and majority as categories and concepts within the state, within the modern state. Um, and what he argues in this speech and in many other places is that the Muslims of the subcontinent are not a minority. It's really a very remarkable claim and a remarkable understanding of what these terms uh, mean and what they can mean. So let me quickly uh, just read out uh, this um, uh, uh, another passage. Siyasi bol chal mein jab kabhi akliyat ka lafz bola jata hai, akliyat minority, to usse maksud ye nahi hota ke riyazi ke aam hisabi qaide ke mutabit insani afraad ki har aisi tadad jo ek dousri tadad se kam ho, lazmi taur par akliyat hoti hai, aur usse apni hifazat ki taraf se mustarib hona chahiye, balke isse maksud ek aisi kamzor jamaat hoti hai, جو تعداد اور صلاحیت دونوں اعتباروں سے اپنے کو اس قابل نہیں پاتی کہ ایک بڑے اور طاقتور گروہ کے ساتھ رہ کر اپنی حفاظت کے لیے خود اپنے اوپر اعتماد کر سکے okay so uh, um, uh, and and uh, um, uh, is, sorry i'll go on is حیثیت کے تصور کے لیے صرف یہی کافی نہیں کہ ایک گروہ کی تعداد کی نسبت دوسرے گروہ سے کم ہو بلکہ یہ بھی ضروری ہے کہ بجائے خود کم ہو اور اتنی کم ہو کہ اس سے اپنی حفاظت کی توقع نہ کی جا سکے ساتھ ہی اس میں تعداد and in brackets it says number کے ساتھ نویت and in brackets it says kind ساتھ ہی اس میں تعداد کے ساتھ نویت کا سوال بھی کام کرتا ہے It's an extraordinary understanding that minority is not simply a numerical fact, a naturally given property of a group that is numerically uh, smaller than some other group, uh, Jamaat, as he says, uh, but rather that it's a social and political institution and that it has to do with social force, with social prestige, with social force and so on. It's a, it's, a, it's a term that is defined by power rather than by the social geometry of power rather than by uh, simply uh, number. We can talk more about this in, in, in Q&A. So these are two very important things that he does here. Uh, uh, the question of Muslim identity and the question of the very nature of majority and minority in the modern state, in modern politics, and so on. Um, the account that he gives, uh, the historical account that he gives, and this is the, my third point here, the historical account that, that he gives of the re religio-political conflict in India is very distinct, distinct and very far from the account that Nehru gives in Discovery. Those who, who, of you who have read Discovery of India will be very familiar with this. Nehru, Nehru presents the, in, the history of India and the question of the identity of Indian civilization in terms of a long series of invasions, okay, from outside, arrivals from outside. And the genius of Indian civilization for Nehru is that it absorbs and assimilates every foreign intruder, every foreign or alien element, except the British, he says. The British have remained aloof and have not become Indian. Um, the, the Turks and the Afghans, the Turkic peoples of Central Asia and the Afghans came and became Indian, the Mughals came and became Indian and so on. Um, um, distinctly Indian uh, 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 group and culture and so on. Um, uh, and he sees the question of the, the, the presence of the Muslim population in contemporary India through a narrative of conversion, right? That, that the overwhelming majority of the Muslims of India are in fact, <clears throat> Uh, converted from um, uh, Hindu caste society and from the lower rungs of uh, caste society uh, and so on. 
Um, Azad gives really a, a, a very different account, okay? In some ways more progressive, in some ways less progressive, it seems to me, uh, than Nehru's account. Um, sorry, just one second, please. Um, Azad tells this story, this historical story, from the perspective not of the entity that, from the perspective of the entity that arrives, as it were, from outside. That is to say, from the perspective of, of Islam and Muslims and so on, not the entity that receives, right, in, in uh, uh, Nehruvian terms, namely uh, Indian civilization, and that absorbs that foreign element. And instead of a conversion account, very fascinating, very different from Nehru's uh, account and understanding. Instead of a conversion account as in Nehru, uh, uh, Azad tells the story within the terms of the fictive kinship on the Ashraf, right? The fiction that, uh, the fiction that, um, um, uh, uh, that the social groups are descended from outsiders of various sorts, uh, Sayyids, Sheikhs, Patans, Mughals, and so on. Um, essentially, that narrative remains intact. So in that sense, really, a, 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 um, a, a, not a progressive understanding of uh, uh, Indian Muslim life uh, and the history of, of Islam in India. So there's, there's a very complex contradictory figure in that regard. But in many other ways, Gubara, I think, really is a greater book than Discovery, giving a far more nuanced account um, uh, of the Hindu-Muslim question. Um, and I, I guess I'll, I, I'll have to talk about it really in, um, um, uh, in um, uh, sort of in Q&A a, a little bit. Um, another text that I think would be important to consider in this regard, these questions that I've just been outlining, is his famous khutbah uh, at Jama Masjid uh, in October 1947. I believe it's October. I think it's 1st of October 1947. Uh, it's a remarkable address, a Friday, Friday sermon, Friday khutbah. Remarkable address um, calling to Muslims whom he addresses in the second person uh, singular and informal as tum, a very informal mode of speech rather than up. Uh, he chastises uh, uh, Muslim India, this tum that he addresses uh, uh, for having played out the politics of fear and now having encountered real fear with the partition of India and all uh, that followed in its wake. Um, and I'll just read out very quickly a couple of uh, uh, small passages from here, and then um, uh, and and then I'll stop. Um, one second, please. Um, Well, you know what? I think since I've already sort of laid out that argument through the uh, uh, through the um, um, uh, Ramgar address, I'll I'll move on to Ghubare Khater. I really do want to say a few words about it. So Ghubare Khater, is, as I said, is a very peculiar book, um, and it's a kind of um, you know it's a, it's it's inseparable from discovery of India. It's really a work that is inseparable from from that major canonical work of Indian nationalism. And yet, I, I don't think we can say that Rubare Khadr is a canonical work of, of uh, Indian nationalism in the same way. Uh, only recently been translated, by the way. Well, not, not recently anymore, I guess. I think in the 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. If there's, uh, uh, in a not very good translation, I must say. Uh, if, if anyone knows of a more recent translation, please uh, do let me know. Uh, it's written as a series of letters, as I said, uh, written during the internment in um, uh, in um, uh, um, Ahmednagar Fort, most of them written there. There are, are 24 letters, a few of the opening letters and the final letters written uh, um, um, after uh, coming out of prison and so on. Um, and I will just 
uh, point to one letter here. I don't have time to really discuss this book in any kind of detail. It's extraordinary work, as I said. And that is um, uh, a, a letter that is actually, that actually, unlike most of them, uh, has a title. Um, And the title is uh, Churiya Chure Ki Kahani. Uh, and it's an allegory, essentially, okay, in which he describes his encounters with a group of, of um, uh, birds that have taken up residence in his barracks. Um, you know, they, they've built a nest up there in the rafters and so on. And it's really a, a, a very funny, first of all, but very moving account of an encounter between two different entities, between two different beings, between two different types of being, in fact. So let me read a couple of passages out here, uh, as I said, and then I'll stop. Um, so he chases them away uh, uh, and you know they sort of fly away. And, um, um, uh, and this happens a couple of times. And then he says, Really beautiful language. He says, Ab dushman ki fauj titar bitar ho gai thi. He's referring to the birds. Magar ye andesha baaki tha ke kahin phir ikatthi ho kar madan ka rukh na kare. Tajrbe se malum hua tha ke baas ke neze ki habit dushmano par khub chha gai hai. He gets a bamboo staff to sort of chase them away. Jis taraf rukh karta tha, usse dekhte hi karmai farar parte thai. इसलिए फैसला किया कि अभी कुछ अरसे तक उसे कमरे में रहने दिया जाए अगर बांस को अगर किसी इक्का दुक्का हरीफ ने रुख करने की जरूरत भी की तो ये सर बफलक नेजा देखकर उल्टे पांव भागने पर मजबूर हो जाएगा इट्स अ काइंड ऑफ मॉक हीरोइक टोन यू नो व्हाट इन लिटरेरी क्रिटिसिज्म वी रिफर टू एज अ मॉक हीरोइक टोन दैट इज टू से यूजिंग अ काइंड ऑफ हीरोइक uh, register or rhetoric to describe very mundane, non-heroic sort of events. Chunache aise hi kiya gaya. Sab se purana ghosla mood hone ki table ke upar tha. Baas is tarah wahan khada kar diya gaya ki uska sar ke uska sira thik thik ghosle ke darwaze ke paas pahunch gaya tha. अब गो मुस्तबिल अंदेशों से खाली न था ताहम तबीयत मुतमिन थी कि अपनी तरफ से सरो सामान जंग में कोई कमी नहीं की गई है एंड देन ही सेज अब 11 बज रहे थे मैं खाने के लिए चला गया थोड़ी देर के बाद वापस आया तो कमरे में कदम रखते ही ठिठक के रह गया क्या देखता हूं कि सारा कमरा फिर हरीफ के कब्जे में है और इस इत्मीनान और फरागत से अपने कामों में मशगूल हैं जैसे कोई हादसा पेश आया ही नहीं अगेन सर ऑफ कंटिन्यूइंग दिस मॉक हीरोइक टोन एंड देन ही सर ऑफ डिस्क्राइब्स हाउ ही देन एडजस्टेड हिज एटीट्यूड टुवर्ड्स देम एंड इंस्टेड ऑफ ट्राइंग टू ड्राइव देम अवे ही कवर्ड ही लेड आउट सम शीट्स एंड थिंग्स on the the dressing table that he that he wanted to keep clean from the debris that was falling from the nest and so on and let them live you, you know let them sort of live there not chase them out not treat them like the enemy treat them sort of like like the neighbor okay uh then he says ab ye fikr hui ke aisi rasm aur raah ikhtiyar karni chahiye ke in nakhwanda mehmano ke sath ek ghar mein guzar गुजारा हो सके एक्स्ट्रॉर्डनरी स्टेटमेंट दैट इज टू से हाउ टू ग्रुप्स इनिशियली अनकॉम्प्रिहेंडिंग ऑफ इच अदर इनिशियली हॉस्टाइल टू इच अदर मे एक्चुअली फाइंड अ मोड ऑफ विवेंदी मे एक्चुअली फाइंड अ मोड ऑफ लिविंग टूगेदर ओके एंड द सॉर्ट ऑफ नेसेसिटी ऑफ फाइंडिंग दैट मोड इन अदर वर्ड वट इज ऑफरिंग अस हियर इज इज अ काइंड ऑफ एथिक्स ऑफ को एग्जिस्टेंस यू नो Uh, it's a really powerful allegory uh, uh, and he refers to it as an allegory by by referring to it as meri mintaq tayr referring to the um, uh, so called conference of the birds in english translation uh, allegory by uh, fariduddin uh, attar um so it's explicitly written as an allegory i don't think i'm pushing that idea uh, onto this text 
Uh, and then finally he says, I realized that in fact, we have to do more than merely coexist. We have to sort of really get to lose each other's uh, fear of each other and kind of really, uh, really uh, uh, even find a certain love for each other. And then he describes this, I won't read the passage, I'll just summarize it. He describes this sort of extraordinary exchange where he keeps a few grains of rice uh, next to his uh, uh, next to himself when he's sitting on the sofa writing. Uh, and this bird begins to approach him through all kinds of maneuvers and moves very slowly. And he says, uh, It's an extraordinary statement. In order to diffuse the fear that the other being, the smaller being, the, the weaker, less powerful being has of this more powerful being, this powerful being suppresses his own subjectivity, becomes an element of nature, okay? Uh, 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 suppresses his his agency, his capacity to act and do do harm to this this other being, and so on. So it seems to me, and and in fact, they reach a kind of uh, uh, again a kind of intimate uh, relation where the 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 bird would even come and sit on his paper on which he's writing and his hand and so on, and he sits perfectly still, writes like stone. He says. So as I see it, uh, this is really an allegory of uh, 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 an allegorical ethics, let's say. Through allegory, he's presenting us with an ethics of majority-minority coexistence, okay? How a larger force uh, becomes, um, uh, uh, um, how a larger force helps the smaller force overcome its fear of the larger force, okay? Uh, uh, in other words, it requires certain movements of both sides of the equation. Uh, both the more powerful force and the weaker force, uh, the weaker being, the powerful being and the weaker being must make adjustments to their sort of naturally given modes of being and relation to each other uh, in order to uh, overcome uh, uh, the fear that they have of each other, okay? It's really a very powerful um, 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 mode of elaborating a, an ethics of coexistence, the likes of which I, I don't really know of, you know, in, I mean, aside from the al allegory, aside from the story, uh, the ethics that I that emerge here really, I don't really know of in any other major thinker of the nationalist movement. It's really quite unique in that. In any case, I think I should stop now. So what I just want to say sort of in the end is that, that um, um, you know, Azad is in many ways a kind of exilic thinker. Uh, and he actually says uh, in, in, in a remarkable passage here, uh, I have lived in exile while living in my own homeland. Okay, I have adopted that posture. Uh, and that is at the core of this ethics, I think, of coexistence that he uh, that he presents to us at the very moment in which the possibility of that coexistence was um, uh, was being destroyed uh, in in uh, in communal conflict and the partition of India. I'll stop there. Isha. Thank you. Sorry, I think I went a little too uh, long. Thank you, Amir Saab, as usual, very well, very powerful uh, talk. And now I invite uh, our Dr. Professor Asim Siddiqui Saab to conclude this talk, and then we will move to question and answer. Asim. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Razi Bhai. And thank you very much for uh, having me in this uh, discussion. Uh, in fact, I thoroughly enjoyed this talk. And I must say, uh, this talk was really delivered with a lot of clarity. And uh, Edward Said is one of my favorite writers. So no wonder that uh, some of his clarity has rubbed off on his student, Dr. Amir Mufti. Otherwise, you know that uh, sometimes we can appreciate a talk, but, but understand that little. And here I must say that I understood each and every part of this talk, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, for many of us, actually, uh, or uh, some of uh, the parchment who might have joined late, let me just uh, uh, briefly summarize what the learned his speaker has uh, spoken this evening. Uh, 
he talked about dr amr he talked about many azads that means uh, we cannot have a simplistic understanding of azad but rather there are uh, different dimensions of azad's personality there are different dimensions of azad's work and i am very happy to say that this complexity of the man and complexity of his work has been very ably brought out in this discussion uh, of course there is the azad of religious disputation which dr amir mufti so eloquently talked about and there is also the azad who is a great anti colonial thinker uh, and of course Uh, azar's taqlidi religiosity and how his relationship with the uh, alighur rationalism so that means uh, this tension between uh, taqlidi religiosity and alighur rationalism it was very ably brought out i i would say that uh, azad actually has a very ambivalent kind of attitude towards alighur and uh, there are any number of uh, alighur scholars who would say that uh, Uh, as far as uh, azad's relationship with aligarh movement is concerned then at best it is ambivalent and uh, there are also many detractors of azad who will say that azad uh, never really try try to do much for uh, making aligarh muslim university a university or even uh, after aligarh muslim university became a university there was very little that azad did for the university so obviously this is a charge and uh, and uh, uh, many detractors of azad point out that they could not find much evidence of azad support for aligarh as such so i think this is one point in fact uh, which can be taken up uh, and of course in this entire discussion uh, uh, what i really found very interesting that azad is not at all uh, a known figure in pakistan otherwise i was thinking that azad must be a well known figure in pakistan also so that way it was uh, really a learning experience for me and another very important thing that came up in this uh, discussion that azad is something of uh, a mystery figure especially in the anglophone world and uh, basically Uh, the anglophone world knows azad through his english translations and as uh, dr amar mufti pointed out sometimes these translations are not very good either uh, and of course uh, there is that very important dimension of azad's work that he was the president of congress party youngest president and in fact uh, probably he was also the president of the congress party for maximum number of time his problems with traditional ulama uh azad was not a traditional um, alim in that sense and uh, he was not uh, that way very comfortable with that traditional view so that means uh, uh, that way uh, one can say that he shares uh, that particular ground with sir sayed ahmed khan also because sir sayed ahmed khan also had his problem with traditional ulama and here i particularly found this discussion of azad as a secular scholar very interesting and of course uh, we have all read uh, gobare khatir and uh, especially azad as a master stylist so this literary dimension of azad's work was also very much part of this discussion uh, and especially towards the end when uh, azad talks about this entire dynamics of minority and majority and how it has been presented in an allegorical manner and uh, i must say that, that that discussion was very interesting uh, we know that uh, minority or majority they are not simply concepts which can be discussed in numerical terms rather this is also something related to the question of power and of course uh, that was uh, azad's view also what i found really very interesting uh, dr amir mufti it was that comparison between those two books gubare khatir and discovery of india uh, and especially the parallel that you drew between these two books their timing and their concerns and especially the social concerns at the back of those books and how in some ways gubare khatir appears a better book i found this discussion really very interesting and i would rather also invite your attention to another very important work on azad which was written as a kind of response to india wins freedom that was rajmohan gandhi's book india wins india wins errors so that we uh, that is also one very interesting work which talks about some uh, errors in uh, india wins freedom 
in fact i also remember when there was so much discussion about those 30 pages and uh, we all were uh, greatly puzzled as to what was there in those 30 pages but later when uh, whatever appeared in those 30 pages uh, history proves that uh, sometimes we realize that okay uh, uh, something earth shaking is going to happen but actually that doesn't happen and i am reminded of mark twins uh, mark twins famous work mark twin uh, wrote his famous his criticism of bible and many other things but he made this will that those things will be published or should be should see the light of the day after his death uh, because uh, he thought that his criticism of Bible and his thought, his criticism of Christianity was very, very radical. So that way, sometimes we realize that something is really very radical, but uh, history proves uh, otherwise. Uh, I, I would also like to know something from you about Azaz pan-Islamism, especially his pan-Islamism of 19, uh, 20, in, in 1924 when uh, he was talking about this and how did he nurse that ambition to uh, become a sort of imam in india also or imam of indian muslims also so yeah. that ambition also yeah okay and uh, whether he felt disappointed that uh, he was not considered in that light uh, i must say that uh, this discussion was very interesting and uh, that another very important point was about the question of muslim identity in fact, today, uh, even that quotation of Azad, which you read, in fact, in today's terms, actually, that can be considered very problematic. Problematic in the sense that uh, the very idea of uh, locating one's identity in some form outside India, that can become very, very problematic. So, but uh, I think that is also a very powerful statement in favor of Indian secularism, that you can have your uh, religious identity at the same time you can have your Indian identity and there is hardly any contradiction between these two identities. So I think that is a fair point. And here uh, uh, at this moment, uh, there is also this uh, conflict over the idea of India, the idea of Indian secularism. So I feel what Azad said at that time, that is very valid even now that uh, one can have one's religious identity, one can yeah. have one's religious symbols, but uh, at the same time, one can be very proud of one's uh, national identity. But of course, there are sometimes demands of uh, nation states at different times. And of course, the question of identity also becomes problematic. So in all, I must say that uh, it was uh, a very thought provoking lecture, very interesting lecture. And I must repeat this point that all points were made with great clarity because uh, clarity is something which is not always very common and no wonder we have a student of Edward Said and I love each and every word that Edward Said writes and uh, I'm also saying with this knowledge that there are many other thinkers whose books I have but I find them really painful to read those books, but Said is always a pleasure. And lovely to see uh, Dr. Amir Mufti talking about it. And also good to know that uh, the second edition of your book is coming, Enlightened Women Economy. Uh, we look forward to that book. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Asim Saab, and thank you all speakers. Mm. Before we go to question and answer session, here is coming weeks, uh, another very important event. Uh, we have put three scientists, Gohar Raza Saab, and a very well-known personality from Pakistan, Professor Parvez Bai and, Parvez, uh, and Professor Ravi Sinha Saab. So two from India, one from Pakistan, all scientists, all activists, uh, and they are going to talk on absence of scientific temple in the lands of scientists like uh, Sidi Raman, Jagdish Bose, and Abdus Salam sir. So stay tuned, coming Saturday, please join. It would be a very uh, nice uh, theme to um, introspect, see why we are so uh, lacking so much scientific temper in spite of uh, so many educated people in the subcontinent. Over to question answer session. That will be moderated by our host, uh, Dr. Rafat Hussain. And 
please be patient, be very brief. Just take, just have one question so that others can also participate. Uh, Rafat, please take care. Rafat. Thank you, Razi Bhai. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Professor Amir Mutti Saad, Salman Kulaiki Saab, Professor Mohammad Asim Siddiqui. And of course, it was a very in-depth uh, discussion on Maulana Abul Kalam Azaz's uh, contribution to the Indian education and his uh, um, outlook uh, about the India. So there are two options to ask the question. And most of you already know that you have raised a digital hand and you have shown interest in uh, the chat box. So first question was from Dr. Nazir Ahmad, but uh, he has to go somewhere, but let me see if I can find his question. Uh, so uh, let me go to the next one and then what I will come back to Nazir Saab's question. Uh, Mujib Saab, please go ahead, unmute yourself. Uh, 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 Amir Saab, it's a brilliant lecture and I learned a great deal from listening to you. This is Mujibur Rahman from Jamia from New Delhi. Uh, hi, uh, uh, I have two questions, but I'm going to ask just one question. And if there is time, then I'd do the follow up. Uh, my question is this, in the context of contemporary politics, in a manner that that uh, that, that that is unfolding in India, uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, you did an extremely good job in terms of juxtaposing Azad with regard to Nehru, Madhudi and all of that. Uh, I was wondering if you, you could shed some light with respect to Hindu right. Say, for instance, his engagement with Sabarkar, was there any engagement or what is the engagement of Sabarkar towards him? Uh, you know, my assumption is that, that, that it is possible that uh, both Hindu right and uh, separatists, they treated him with equal contempt. And I was just wondering whether one can delineate uh, what are the reasons and what, what are the uh, you know, uh, how this contempt or despise towards him uh, kind of uh, was constructed uh, in the respective discourses. Thank you. Ji, Amir sir, aapka jawab, uh, unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, shall we take a few questions uh, and then I can respond, or would you like me to take them one at a time? If you can take one at a time. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Be, be, brief, be brief. That's all I can. Yeah, do. yeah. Uh, so um, yes, uh, I, I'm not aware of any direct engagements uh, with figures like Savarkar uh, in the case of. Uh, uh, um, or, or earlier uh, figures in the RSS, uh, in the history of the RSS in the early years. Um, I'm not aware of uh, Azad's involvement uh, with any of them, but if somebody knows, has some in, in, uh, information to the contrary, I, I would be really very, very grateful. Uh, he does, um, in the Ramgar address, uh, very remarkably um, equate Muslim separatism and, and uh, essentially a kind of Hindutva position. Um, and I'm just trying to find the passage. If you just give me one second here. Um, so sorry, just give me one second, please. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's in the Ramgarh address. Well, I, I, I won't immediately be able to find the passage, but he essentially equates the two. He says, um, um, he, he criticizes, he offers this long critique of Muslim separatism, the idea of, of uh, separate Muslim nationhood and so on, and speaks of a kind of uh, undivided um, uh, Indian uh, reality and, 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 and Indian identity and, and social reality and so on. Um, and speaks of the separatist idea as a dangerous idea. And in fact, argues that uh, it is against the teachings of Islam. That's the remarkable thing that he does, okay, in a number of his writings. And I think the long volume on um, Surah Fatiha is also really, uh, in many ways, uh, animated by, uh, by this question, uh, by this project of his. 
bringing his Islamic learning to the question of uh, the Hindu-Muslim conflict, okay? And the reason that it goes against the teachings of Islam is because separatism is a dangerous evasion of actual historical reality, okay? It is an attempt to imagine some, some Muslim society, some Muslim reality uh, that uh, that is uh, completely oblivious to the actual reality uh, of the moment and its long history, okay? Uh, and Islam is nothing for him if not, in fact, a kind of enlightening and rationalizing um, um, uh, force in human history, okay? It rationalizes and uh, uh, even the monotheistic tradition from Judaism into Christianity into Islam, let's say, uh, and it enjoins a kind of enlightenment and a ras rational being on the practicing believer, okay, on, on the believer and practitioner of Islam. So uh, it, it goes against the tenets of Islam, this, his, this evasion of historical reality, and it's a dangerous evasion of historical reality, this desire to create a separate existence, to go back to the past, uh, uh, and, and so on. And then he says, uh, if there are among us some Hindus who want to also return to the India of a thousand years ago, they are living also a dangerous dream, he says. Uh, and, and so he sees both Muslim separatism of even a secular figure like, like, um, like uh, uh, Jinnah, uh, secular in the normal sense of the word, uh, communalist but secular, you know, this weird thing that Jinnah embodies. Um, he sees Muslim separatism uh, uh, as being on a continuum with Hindu nationalism. There's no doubt about that, okay? So that's that's what I would say. He had, he, I, I don't know about personal contacts or experience or anything like that, but in his thinking, the two are related. The two are two sides of the same dangerous impulse in contemporary Indian society, in modern Indian society. Um, uh, and really in some ways he's, he understands that both the Muslim separatists and the Hindutvadis are believers in the two nation theory. You know, the two nation theory is not just a product of Jinnah and the Muslim league, but is also very much part of uh, the politics of the Hindu right. Thank you for that question. Great question. Yeah, please, Rudrangshu, uh, be brief. Just one question. Okay, so let, hold on for a second. Um, there was a question from uh, Nazir Saab, who has already left. What would Molana have said to his fellow countrymen under the spell of Hindutva, current Hindutva? I think what I just said. It's mm -hmm. a hypothetical question, but- Yes, it yes, it is hypothetical, but I think he would say what I've just said. That is to yes. say, that is to say that he sees uh, communalist separatisms uh, as uh, embodying a dangerous evasion of historical reality. Um, and it is their evasion of historical reality, their disavowal of historical reality, their inability to comprehend historical reality, uh, that is a living danger to society, okay? That no society can survive such, um, such, um, uh, such uh, ev ev evasion uh, of, of, of the actual, you know. Thank you. Rudranshu, please go ahead. आमिर भाई आप जिस आप जिसको ढूंढ रहे थे जिस पैसेज को वहाँ खत्म होता है कि कुदरत के मक्खी हाथों ने ये काम किया हुआ है और आप इसको अलग नहीं कर सकते। Yes, thank you. शुक्रिया बहुत बहुत। Thank you, Amita sir. So, Rudran, should go ahead, please. Well, and Mufti sir, sir, your lecture was elegant, and uh, I would love to continue hearing you again and again and again. But my question <laughs> at this juncture is that uh, how would you rate uh, Azad as an education minister? What was his contribution in converting 
a broken, torn down nation into a modern nation state through scientific, through establishing scientific institutions like the Indian Inst Institutes of Technology, etc. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, you know, for more than a decade, the education minister of, of uh, India was a man who thought he lived in the 19th century, you know, who thought that his education was of the 19th century, his formation and so on, that he was an anachronistic figure and not fully of the modern world and so on, okay? Uh, and um, Ejaz Ahmed, for instance, thinks that there are not major accomplishments as education minister. I don't think that's entirely true uh, Azad, as I understand it, I'm not an expert in this by any means, but as uh, Azad, as I understand it, placed uh, emphasis on adult education, on sort of universal primary education. Uh, I mean, you know, when we think about what the, the situation of um, education would have been in, in 1947, even the absence of literacy for the great majority and so on, I mean, effective literacy, you know, um, those were very, very important, uh, 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 very important projects that that he focused on, and so on. He is responsible, famously, of course, for the um, uh, what is it called, the Indian uh, Cultural. Sorry, what's the exact name? Somebody will know here. Um, Indian Council of Cultural Relations. Council of Cultural Relations. That's entirely an Azad project. Okay. Uh, when we think of internationalism in uh, India in that period, we think of Nehru, you know, he's the canonical figure of a kind of anti-colonial internationalism and so on. But Azad as well, very much so. Uh, um, not simply in relation to the Islamic world, by the way, although that's a very strong element as well, developed relations with, uh, uh, with, with uh, other Islamic countries uh, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, I, I I think uh, like with almost everything in his in his life and career, uh, there's something paradoxical about his role as an education minister, uh, the, a man who um, he he knew English, but really not as a sort of native speaker, not as someone uh, like um, uh, like Nehru, uh, above all, but even uh, a whole host of other figures uh, of his, his uh, among his contemporaries. Um, uh, and and he's the minister of education for all these years, and um, uh, as uh, as you mentioned, uh, responsible in many ways for uh, starting the, the 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 move toward the uh, formation of the system of IITs uh, that has played such an incredible role uh, in in postcolonial history uh, of in uh, post in the in the history of the world in the last several decades, right? I mean in the personnel that uh, the system has provided to the global tech industry and the tech revolution and so on. Thank, any, you, thank, you, yes. thank you, Professor. So please be brief. There are a lot of questions. OK, lying. all right. All have right. A lot of interest. So Javed Hussain Saab showed interest in the chat box. Javed Hussain Saab. And next person is Aftab Saab. Javed Hussain Saab, please unmute yourself. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask, as Education Minister of India, uh, Molana Azad, am I audible? Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, like, uh, do you can can you please comment on uh, how Azad looked at Jamia Millia Islamia after he became Minister of Education in India? Thank you. Very interesting question. I, I can't say I can say a great deal about this, uh, but of course, he's one of the founders of Jama Milia. Um, and this pertains to the earlier question, actually, that um, uh, Asim Saab uh, had raised about um, uh, what is his perceived lack of support for Aligarh. Well, I mean, Aligarh was the gar, let's say, of uh, Muslim separatism, right? I mean, throughout the 20s and 30s. Uh, I say this as an insider, by the way, to Aligarh culture. The, of my entire parental generation of men in my family, my father, my uncles, my ch chacha, my taya, my khalu, my mamu, everybody went to Aligarh, okay? Uh, so I, I, um, 
Uh, I grew up very much in this uh, in this sort of culture of the Aligarh Ali old boys and so on. So uh, as they used to be called. Any in any case, um, uh, it's not surprising that he would have an ambivalent attitude. It seems to me towards Aligarh because of that complex his history. Uh, and he was, I believe, instrumental in moving the early Jamia uh, as, as in its very early years from Aligarh to Delhi. Uh, he himself was very uh, centrally involved in that. So um, it's, it's not a surprise that, that in many ways he seemed to be closer to Jamia than to, um, uh, than to Aligarh. Anyway, I hope that's sufficient answer. Rapper, next question, please. Proper. Okay, thank you. Aftab Sahib, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for a beautiful lecture. Thank you, Rajivai, for organizing this. Uh, who can forget great Maulana contribution in the establishment of IIT's Indian Premier Technical Institute? Uh, so I missed some portion of uh, the presentation. That's why actually I have this question for uh, Brother Amir. Um, so like Nehru believed that most of the Muslims basically came from Hindu lot after conversion, right? So did Azad, Maulana Azad think differently? Uh, just, just, just curious, actually. This is a fascinating question. And I, do, I can't say that I have a great deal of information on it. Um, um, there may be something on it in um, Masood Alam Falahi's book on Zat Pat, uh, uh, um, Hindustan Me Zat Pat or Musliman, this great book on uh, the Muslim caste system uh, in um, uh, in in India, um, but he uh, he essentially in his in the writings that I'm that I've been discussing that I've sort of shared with you, he's essentially writing from the perspective of the Shurafa. Okay, he speaks of Muslims coming from outside. He speak uses words images like karva, jab hamara kafla, jab hamara karva, yahan par aakar ruka. You know, all these images that suggest a, a kind of uncritical uh, 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 expression of, um, of what, um, uh, what I would call the fictive kinship narratives of Ashraf society. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I also have an anthropologist hat. I've been trained in anthropology as well. And in anthropology, we have this concept of... Uh, fictive kinship okay that is to say uh, how the way in which social groups imagine collectively imagine their their descent their their kinship structure and so on and of course i mean you know i'm supposed to be a descendant of the prophet at least in part so this is part of the the the, the fictive kinship uh, of of these classes and castes of people that we call the shurafa uh, I'm both a descendant of the Prophet and of uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, by the way. Uh, <laughs> in any case, so um, um, so he essentially assumes that. I mean, it's really quite remarkable that this major figure uh, in the Congress, so close to Nehru, uh, related to the to the uh, progressive wing of the party in many ways. Uh, despite you know not being sort of uh, not being a Marxist or anything like that, or influenced heavily by Marx and so on, um, and yet he takes this very reactionary, very conservative conception of the uh, social origins of Muslims in India and the historical origins. Okay, he just sees them sees Muslims as a collectivity. Now, if somebody had said to him, "What about the the?" Uh, Ajlaf and Arzal Kas, I, I don't know what he would say. Uh, maybe there is some writing at some point. I mean, Azad has written too much really for anyone to claim to uh, know all his writing and it's also scattered. You know, this drives me crazy. Unlike the works of Nehru and Gandhi where every memo, every letter has been preserved and is part of the, the collected works and so on. Nothing like that has been done uh, with, 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 uh, with Azad. And it's not just a language thing. I mean, after all, the Gujarati writings of, of uh, Gandhi are available in English in the collected works and so on in translation. Uh, so that's what I would say. I'll, I'll stop there. He takes yeah, a thank you. surprisingly thank you. reactionary view, really. Yeah. So I just wanted to remind everyone that I have not ignored anyone. The num all names are noted here. 
be there uh, woman or men. So next person is uh, Nishazadi. And after that is Amna and then Sayyad Amir. So go ahead, Nishazadi, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Rafat Sahab. Hi, Amir. I'm Nishad Zaidi from Jamia Milia Islamia. Uh, thank you for writing such a wonderful book. I think Enlightenment in the in call one of the most significant books when it comes to a study of formation of Muslim identity in India. Um, uh, my question is, you know, you've talked about how Azad resisted um, Nehruvian model of minoritization of Muslims. Nehru always spoke in terms of minority and numerical strength, whereas Azad's discourse was completely different. He resisted this minoritization. Uh, on the other hand, you also suggested, and which I found very fascinating, that he also had this sense of uh, uh, um, alienation in the sense that he called himself Garibul Watan. Uh, so uh, did Azad also suffer from something like double consciousness that Faisal Devji has spoken about in, in context of Indian Muslims? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And Mufti Sa, please be brief. There are a lot many questions lined up. Uh, I would agree with you. I've actually argued that explicitly in Enlightenment in the Colony in, in just a small passage, um, the, the, the question of double consciousness. Um, this is a phrase that comes to us from the African-American writer and thinker, W.E.B. Du Bois, writing in the first decade of the 20th century about African-American consciousness as a double consciousness, you know, that is a consciousness always aware of itself and so on in the world, self-aware, self-conscious uh, in a kind of anxious and awkward way and so on. And I've argued that uh, explicitly, uh, that, that what he's describing in fact is the experience of minorities in general. Uh, and this is as much true in some ways uh, of uh, if there is something we can call Muslim consciousness, certainly Muslims social experience, um, uh, that this is very much present there uh, uh, as well. Uh, so yes, I, I would agree with you, yeah. Thank you. Um, next is Amna Latif and then Sayyid Amir. After that, Abdul Jabbar, so be ready. Amna Latif, please. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, sir, I'm Amna Latif. Uh, uh, I'm doing my PhD from Punjab University. And this is my second year of research. Sir, uh, as uh, you know that we are... Uh, not Sorry, which Punjab? Punjab, Lahore. Lahore. I'm from okay. Lahore. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, as you know that we are not much familiar with double kalam azad though we we we, we know pretty pretty much uh, uh, bits and pieces what you talk about today i am referring to this bird uh, your last uh, part of your uh, presentation bird allegory and then uh, uh, ramgar address uh, i was wondering uh, and and uh, this question rises in my mind that uh, uh, molana was uh, very close to nehru and and the president of congress uh, and then uh, you explain in ram uh, ramgar address that he was against this communal separatism so was he not able to uh, talk and uh, you know uh, talk about within the congress uh, circle or with hard core Congress circle and Nehru, you know, so that uh, they can find some uh, way between uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, although, I mean, it's, it's just come in uh, my mind. Please, as... please, be, please be very specific. Please, ask the question, question, please. please uh, not... Don't go in the background. Please ask the question. Uh, was he not able to convince uh, uh, Congress being a president or uh, influence or, or or was he not convinced uh, Nehru, you know, to, to find some uh, way in between uh, uh, partition? That's it. Thank well, you. I mean, the Congress leadership spent two decades trying to find a way, you know, from the 1920s onward, from, let's say, the um, Nehru report, uh, Motilal Nehru report of uh, 1928 onwards, which which envisioned a kind of constitution for independent India and how to deal with the minority questions. They tried repeatedly, but they failed. That's the point. And I think they failed in part because they didn't really understand the problem in the way that Azad understood it, okay? Um, Nehru says, Jawaharlal Nehru says in several places that they uh, agreed to all the provisions that the League of Nations had come up for the protection of minority rights. You know, it's an extraordinary confusion, really, to think of um, uh, uh, you know to 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 think of the League of Nations framework, which collapsed within years, uh, and had already collapsed when Nehru was writing that, right? 
uh, and in, in the outbreak of the Second World War and even uh, before that in the sort of oppression of Jewish minorities and other minorities in Eastern Central Europe. So by no means was that framework of minority rights in any way sufficient in Europe itself. Uh, and Nehru says that the Congress relies on that. We agree to all those provisions, language, religion, freedom, you know, all, all, of, that sort of, uh, all of that sort of stuff. So you're right. Uh, in many ways, he's writing um, uh, against the times. You know, he's, his own thinking is really very much out of time, as the title of my talk says, um, uh, um, uh, out of his own times, uh, really able to see things uh, in a way that not very many people are able to see, not many contemporaries of his and friends and, and colleagues of his are able to see uh, quite in that way. But to him, Thanks. Muslims in undivided India were not a minority, were not a minority. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of more questions, like uh, four questions lined up, and after that we will um, conclude it. Uh, Sayyid Amir Sa. Thank you. Um, I am um, pleased that we share the same name, uh, you and I. I'm not Sayyid Amir. I'm not well, Sayyid Amir. We share the same heritage, part of the Prophet's heritage, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, at least we believe so. Um, I, the most striking uh, uh, feature of Maulana Azad's personality to me is his innate nobility, Sharafat, as we call it in Urdu. Because I am not aware of ever, and he was surrounded by opposition during the partition and before, I'm not aware of any uh, instance in his in any case where a nasty word or uh, a nasty expression uttered um, either from his pen or uh, in his um, lips about anyone. So it was an innate uh, nobility, which is striking and sin is apparently reflected in his attitude towards Aligarh Muslim University. I'm no, I am um, aware of several people commented about him. He, um, in spite of all the hostility um, that a legal Muslim, and I am a student of a legal Muslim university from this school to the MSc degree, but all the hostility and I witnessed some of it firsthand, um, which he encountered or which was extended to him, including the incidents where he was passing in the legal station and the students came and did all kinds of unpleasant things for him. That was just a year or so before independence. In spite yeah. of this, he supported a legal Muslim university, although not overtly, overtly, because he was the education minister of India, not of Muslims. And he supported, he brought Dr. Zakir Hussain at the very critical point where university was really in, in trouble. Most people don't realize it. The, um, so this is a very pervading part, feature of his personality. Um, this is no time, but I would like to ask one question. Mm, there's so much more I could say. The question I have is, it's, um, in, in his writing, as you have mentioned, um, in you have been freedom, Professor Hamayu Kabir has mentioned that he wanted to write a second part of the, his uh, autobiography uh, because it is stopped uh, in, in the freedom. He never got the opportunity. So some people, and uh, legitimately, in, in my view, uh, mentioned that he was wasted uh, getting into politics and becoming education minister because he has so much to offer as a scholar, as, as a writer, as a thinker, and a speaker, which would have immortalized him um, in that respect. Uh, education minister, yes, but as a speaker of Mohan Azad and a journalist, uh, that is the first part of the personality never fully flourished or uh, are revealed or unfold. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think there was a question there. So I mean, I I I, I don't I don't I don't think uh, I don't think the, the, any side of his personality suffered because of other sides of his personality. This is part of his, uh, in you know, he didn't get the opportunity to do all the scholarly work he could have done because sure, but what he's done is pretty enormous, is more than most people can do. Before, so, before, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, great, uh, Jabbar Saab and then Baba Rashid and Asiya. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, remarkable presentation. I uh, enjoyed it, every minute of it. So it's a personal reference. I, I, uh, UCLA, uh, I, I spent seven years at UCLA in the 1980s. <laughs> so, oh. yeah. <laughs> so, so, but uh, then I, this, the, the question, uh, I didn't know uh, Molon Azad was born in Mecca. 
Uh, so I don't know how long he stayed there as a child. Uh, did that kind of birthplace had it, any impact on, on his life story in terms of looking at the life story of Prophet Muhammad? Because Prophet Muhammad left Mecca, he established a community in Medina, it's an inclusive community. Whether he had that kind of uh, in, in, intuition in his life. Thank you. Well, I, I think he, they, his family left uh, India very early in his life. Um, he may have been just a few years old. Um, um, and uh, again, as I said, these early facts of his life are by no means settled. There's all, all kinds of controversies. He's made contradictory statements. We don't know what his native language was. What, is, what was the language he first spoke? Uh, his, his mother is said, it, it, was, it, was it Arabic? His mother is said to, is said to have been Arabian. You know, his, his mother is said to have been Arabian. Um, other accounts say that, yes, she was Arabian, but of a family of Indian origin that, has, that had been in Arabia for, for decades, if not centuries, and so on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, throughout the course of his life, he has not given a consistent, a consistent account of his early life. That's yeah. true. That's true. Okay, thank so, you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rashid, uh, unmute yourself, please. Feba. Uh, okay, Assalamu alaikum. I'm a PhD student at University of Oregon. Um, so my question is with regard to the idea of the historical method itself, as you uh, stated that there's the idea of a historical reality that is often coming into play uh, in, in the in the lecture. Uh, I was thinking about what does it mean to read Azad uh, as a figure, uh, of course, uh, a political figure uh, in the context where... Uh, I'm sorry, am I, am I audible? No, no, go ahead. Uh, somebody is... Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. In the context of nation formation, especially when we consider the uh, philological history of uh, disciplines, right, as such, and its relationship to the secular, the idea of the secular and how it has transformed in the Indian subcontinent, uh, variously in India and Pakistan. Uh, yeah, and of course, that also brings the question of uh, the idea of exiled Muslim, I think, especially post 1857. Uh, this has also, again, had a very different uh, version through official and other historical records. I, I hope my question is kind of clear. Uh, actually, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, um, but you're. I think you're hinting at the, the fact that uh, in general, the emergence of nationalisms in the 19th century, let's say in Europe, uh, first of all, uh, but through the colonial world uh, as well in the 19th and 20th centuries, mm -hmm. um, uh, that what we might call philology, that is to say um, uh, the study or science of texts, um, uh, the historical study of language and so on, of linguistic particulars and the revolution over time, very much centrally a part of the history of nation states and nationalisms. Um, the scholar uh, uh, Katie Trumpuna at Yale uh, has given this phenomenon the name Bardic nationalism, B-A-R-D-I-C, uh, that in the 18th century, for instance, you know, if we think about the whole sort of invention of uh, uh, the idea of the folk tale and um, of um, folk poetry and and uh, and and so on, folk sort of not in the de denigrating sense, but in the German sense of V-O-L-K, you know, the 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 sense of mm -hmm. uh, a distinct people uh, uh, in possession of a distinct written or oral tradition uh, and poetry in particular, and so on. 
these things have been very closely linked to the rise of the nation state. Azad was a philologist. I have no hesitation in saying his knowledge and understanding, his historical knowledge of Arabic and uh, Persian uh, and Urdu, uh, of course, in particular. Um, by the way, he, he was self-taught in a number of uh, European languages to, to various degrees uh, in English and French and so on. He uses French sources uh, in, in, for instance, in Ghubar Khatir. Um, so he's a philologist, uh, uh, definitely. But, uh, but as I said, always with him, there's some peculiarity. Um, he's, he's, not a philo he's not a philologist as a kind of characteristically modern figure of humanistic knowledge. Um, he yokes together that modern knowledge system that comes to us through the colonial state and through colonial institutions with some traditional forms of learning and some traditional forms of the sciences of the human sciences, if we can call it that, uh, in, in um, uh, you know, link, link to, uh, uh, to sort of what he calls uh, Islami Talim, Islam Ki Talim in this passage that I uh, quoted here. Okay, thank you. And, and Javed Saab, your email is noted and uh, you will be added in uh, uh, the distribution list and you will get uh, the information the next week, uh, next week's program. Asiya, Asiya is the last one to ask the question. I am sorry I missed uh, her because somebody said Asiya because I don't see the name and raised. Do you want to ask Asiya? Asiya Zahur. Probably she left. She, she is gone. So Razi Bhai, I have to leave. There, uh, there are people waiting and you please take over from here. But I Bye. just wanted to share and you tell about that program again. This is a uh, next two weeks program. Please, somebody is asking about it. All right. So this is uh, again displayed here and we will send to everyone as uh, we do uh, from Monday and then repeat on Friday. Uh, please do join. This is a uh, really good uh, event um, from India and Pakistan, both scholars from both sides of the same mindset. They are very progressive and very much aggressive also in their approach to transform their lands into more, having more scientific temper. Okay, Rafat, take it out. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. So, Razi Bhai, uh, my apology, I have oh, to yeah, leave. Sure. Go, go, go for wherever you want. Uh, I, I would rather say that this is uh, um, almost two hours. I will request Professor Lelivel to say a few words so that we can conclude, you know, he being the teacher of the speaker and our all to us, very dear, so it's it would be nice if you say a few words. Okay, sir. Well, uh, I want to say uh, I learned much more from Amr than uh, he ever learned from me, and uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, I wanted to add um, uh, just there are so many things to talk about, but I wanted to add the importance of Urdu um, to Azad's uh, concept of uh, language, community, nation, and all of that. And uh, uh, his bitter response in the constitutional debates about the downplaying of Urdu and uh, his efforts to preserve it through the Anjumali Taraki Urdu and, and, and all of that uh, is, is very, a very important uh, concept of language and, and community that can, one can say much about it. As uh, Amr has uh, uh, demonstrated, he was a master uh, Urdu writer. And uh, uh, the Ghuvare uh, Khatir is, is a work that uh, is uh, really need, needs to be uh, probed and studied, not just from the point of view of nationalism, but in the point of view of our relationship to the, the environment and nature and all, all around us. Um, but I, I think uh, uh, there, was a, there was a great bitterness in, um, in Azad's uh, um, uh, feelings about what had happened to Urdu uh, in the in the wake of partition, uh, 
And it was it was blaming everything, the whole situation. And there's a whole story about Azad, Azad's disappointment and bitterness uh, that that appears later on in his life. As education minister, uh, first of all, education was by and large a state power. He didn't have a lot of uh, uh, resources for uh, pr promoting education, and it's a mistake to blame him. He had good people working with him. It's also uh, one more thing I wanted to just mention is Azad was a great orator. And the relationship between the text that you get in Malik Ram or someone else and what he actually said is probably uh, pretty uneven. Um, and he, year after year, he addressed tens of thousands of people in the Calcutta Maidan. You know, he did have a vast following uh, in, in, a, in his way. Uh, he didn't have a political organization except the Congress, and he worked along with that. He went to Oligar in uh, when Az Zakhar Hussain became vice chancellor and spoke at Oligar in 1949, I think it was. And that speech, which is poorly recorded, but still is there, is, is also a very interesting uh, document that uh, uh, needs to be looked at again. But there's so much more to say. And Amir gave a beautiful talk. And uh, um, I look forward to having more conversations. Uh, Wonderful. Thank, thank, thank you, David. You. Great, great to see you here, David. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, engagement uh, as well. Um, I, I mean, you're right. Uh, the, the question of Urdu is very central in his mind from before partition, actually. Um, um, he, he began addressing this question um, uh, very early on um, uh, in the 20s, I believe, uh, you know, when he's addressing gatherings like the Jamiat al Hind and so on. So the question is there for him from fairly early on. And as I sort of understand it, um, uh, you know, he takes a view that is very widely uh, very widely present in some ways uh, among his contemporaries, including in some ways Nehru himself, right, who took really Urdu to be the sort of more encompassing form of the northern vernacular, right, in some ways, and 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 with with more currency, with more um, speakers and readers, and so on, um, as opposed to the Hindi that was just beginning to emerge, right, in a kind of formal way uh, in the teens and twenties. Uh, after Prem Chand turns to to Hindi and you know people like um, uh, Dvivedi and so on, Francesca Orsini has of course written a great history uh, of of this moment in the emergence of modern Hindi, uh, and of course uh, uh, Vasudha Dalmia's book yeah, about the nineteenth century. So um, uh, the, the yeah the bitterness is about the minoritization of Urdu because it, what he. I'm sorry, there's a, some, um, somebody needs to turn off their mic, please, if possible. So, um, um, you know, if you, as one of the questioners kind of uh, hinted at, really what I'm, the way I see Azad's political career and the, the way in which his writing sort of uh, dovetails with or intersects with his political career, uh, if I were to try and give an overall overarching uh, description of that politics, it would be resisting the minoritization of Muslims. And he is already arguing in the, in the 40s that a partition, if it were to take place, would be the actual minoritization of the Muslims. And it's more or less what he says in that famous uh, khutbah in the Jama Masjid in October of 1947, okay? Uh, and again, he sort of, you know, addresses the Muslims of India as tum. I mean, the, the, of course, the immediate audience present in Jama Masjid, but also uh, the wider Muslim community. Um, and he says, uh, you have brought about exactly what you were trying to avoid by adopting a separatist politics, okay? That it is separatism and partition that has in fact minoritized the Muslims of India by turning two thirds of the Muslims of India into non-Indians, into Pakistanis, right? 
uh, on, on both sides uh, of India, in East Bengal and in uh, West Pakistan. So um, I, I, you're right that there is this bitterness. I don't know extensively the post-partition sort of um, um, his, uh, that is to say in what ways as education minister, he addressed this question of, of Urdu in practical terms. I'm, I'm not very familiar with that. So that was, uh, um, thank you for sharing that sort of sense. I'll, I'll certainly look at some of these things uh, that, you've, um, uh, th that you've mentioned. The question of mass following, uh, one last thing in terms of what you said. Uh, I would just, I mean, yes, of course, he's a mass orator. He's a mass orator. Um, and, you know, any major leader of the Congress can marshal mass audiences. And Azad does before he, he, you know, he's a major figure in the Congress as well, because he's already well known as a young journalist and so on. But I wasn't just trying to uh, say that when I said that he's distinct from the other leaders in, in lacking a strong identification with the social collective, okay? The social collective that he can be said to have a strong connection with is the Ashraf, I would say, okay? He, he cannot be the agent of a mobilization of the Muslims, for instance, in the way that the Congress tried half-heartedly in the mid-1930s uh, through uh, uh, Kamar Muhammad Ashraf and, and the mass contacts program, right, in, in 1930s that Nehru encouraged. Uh, Azad is not a figure for any of those. He's too learned a figure. You know, he's too elite and learned a figure, really, uh, um, uh, for one, uh, but also in class and ethnic and social terms, um, lacks a mass Lack, lacks a mass that can be identified with his person in some ways, in, in the ways that many of the other leaders can, I think, you know. I mean, you know, Partha Chatterjee's whole argument is that Gandhi makes that possible for the first time for the Congress, right? I mean, uh, the, that, that really Gandhian politics is about taking bourgeois nationalism to the masses and to bring them into its, um, and to bring them into its, uh, uh, um, sort of historical block uh, in Gramscian terms uh, uh, to serve its own interest. Uh, I mean, it's a, not quite that cynical sounding an argument uh, that uh, Ranjit Guha and Partha Chatterjee have made, but something of that nature. Um, Azad is not a figure of that kind of cathexis, you know, of that kind of connection to a mass. Uh, it's peculiar. I mean, I, I don't have a good answer to it for it, you know, why, why is that the case? Somebody said to me once, why is there no Muslim Gandhi, you know? And that, that's an, it's a slightly naive but interesting question, okay? Uh, because it's a minority. Uh, what would it mean for there to be that kind of cathexis with a leader and mobilization through the figure of a person and so on? Uh, it would have to take national form. In some ways, it's Jinnah who does that for a very brief period towards the end of his career towards the end of his long career from the from the 30s, mid, mid to late 30s onwards. So anyway, Professor fascinating Mufti, question. Thank Professor you. Professor Mufti, I have a trivial question for you. I just heard and maybe you can enlighten me. I Sorry, I'm not sure. Razi Saab, is that you? No, it's me, Amir. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I have never heard that um, Malan Azad's mother was anybody other than an Arab lady. And um, if I recall correctly, he said that uh, I, he grew up as speaking uh, Arabic as a mother tongue. Yes, yes, absolutely. He was not allowed to speak any language by his mother other absolutely. than Arabic. Absolutely, so I'm not questioning that. Evidence, what evidence there is that she wasn't Arabic? I, 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 all I'm saying is that there are, there are a con contradictory accounts. There is an account that, yes, she was Arabic speaking and Arab uh, person, but that the family, again, perhaps... <laughs> Ashraf fictive kinship in reverse, okay? Uh, that that it was a family of distant uh, uh, Indian origin. That's the, and of course Mecca was a cosmopolitan city. There were Muslims from uh, Muslim communities from all over the Islamic world historically. You know, in 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 Ottoman Mecca, uh, cosmopolitan, not in the sense of a modern city like Bombay or something like that. I'm just saying that that there was a kind of Islamic cosmopolitanism to the city of Mecca due to its religious role and, and uh, preeminence and so on. 
नहीं मगर जब वो खुद अपनी किताब में लिख रहे हैं तो फिर उसमें न शक करने की क्या जरूरत है and somebody i if you recall in obare khater he has uh, described his trip to mosul um, to iraq in the severe winter and and, and uh, lebanon so somebody wrote a book uh, afterwards i trying to remember the name who said that he never went to iraq and this or to lebanon that's and, that's and question that's, as well he yeah. said he said he used to say that he was he was educated at al azhar university in cairo nehru actually says that in the uh, discovery of india uh, uh, simply states it as fact and then he retracts it in the um uh, in the eulogy he gives uh, at uh, in parliament at azhar's death nehru actually retracts that statement so uh, please believe me there are many contradictory accounts of his relatively early life one of the facts uh, uh, is is seems to be established that in fact in iraq uh, he was associated with the khanqa that is that is uh, associated with the name of uh, mansur al halaj uh, and that a fellow student there uh, of his was louis massignon you know the great biographer and chronicler of uh, uh, of uh, uh, halaj and uh, their friendship apparently uh, uh, you know they they were friends and correspondents for the rest of uh, uh, azad's life louis massignon uh, and azad uh, amir sahab aapke yeah. dost jo hain salman qureshi ka koi question salman sahab ji ji you very very quickly you know there was uh, some time back there was a talk of an interview that azad gave to a pakistani journalist shorish kashmiri and you know that oh. interview was uncanny in its you know in its predictions about what would happen in terms of international power play should yes. pakistan become so is that is that an accurate uh, is that a really a valid interview valid i i don't know about that i don't know about that but he has a very profound understanding of geopolitics very profound understanding and i mean i've heard i've i've heard this as well that you know the where where he talks about um um uh, where where he talks about uh, um superpower politics and and or world uh, world power as they were called world power politics and um and a state like uh, pakistan as a kind of buffer uh, in the cold war and so on yeah so amir um, sir but what what is this about surish kashmiri what whenever this thing comes up always there is like two camps whether it is a true thing or it is not true thing especially about this particular surish kashmiri's uh, interview why yeah, I, I, i i'm i'm afraid i can't resolve i can't resolve that debate uh, about the authenticity of this uh, uh, of this document yeah well, perhaps that's why salman sir brought it that <laughs> why why that particular interview out of all many contradictory things and all those why that created so much Uh, sensitivity especially among the muslims on this subcontinent always the name and, you know it was published and actually it came up in a geo tv uh, presentation where this question really? interview was turned into a question for the pakistanis okay yeah. this is what azad said would happen now come and disprove him you know so it's that kind of a thing that actually happened on pakistani tv and so that's why i thought maybe it is a genuine thing and also on that issue well it's a sensitive issue about his prediction or his uh, his his almost prophetic uh, prediction yeah. of the dismemberment yes exactly yes. after yes. 25 years yes absolutely absolutely yeah. and that was his pure political prediction that what you are thinking is not what you are getting it something else is there to play anyway thank you very much it is more than 2 hours and we all enjoyed uh, wonderful lecture wonderful engagement please keep joining us and over to uh, for the next uh, next session will be very uh, different but anyway I think thank you amir has it yeah amir sir i am what is your plan to come to this side are you serious uh well i i'll, I'll write to you about that yeah, i'll write to you but i just want i just wanted to thank uh, uh thank uh, everyone for their engagement and questions 
Uh, several people said that it was a very clear presentation. Uh, part of the credit for that goes to uh, Salman Qureshi Saab, because after my last presentation, I asked him, okay, first of all, he had said, you know, you have to speak clearly, you know, not academic, uh, verbose, uh, uh, whatever. So um, uh, after the presentation, I asked him, and so was it clear? He says, well, there were some moments that were not very clear. <laughs> Come on, come on. The last one was also. So I took, I took that, uh, I took that as a challenge. 